Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining Managing Myositis Patient Care during the COVID-19 public health crisis. This is a live question and answer session with Dr. Rohit Agarwal. My name is Jerry Williams, and I am the founder and president of Myositis Support and Understanding. We are an all-volunteer, patient-centered nonprofit organization founded by myositis patients for myositis patients and caregivers. And our mission, basically, and our goal is to work to improve the day-to-day -day lives of myositis patients. You can always learn more about us at our website, understandingmyositis.org. And with that, I would like to uh, quickly introduce our Vice President, Lynn Wilson, who will discuss Myositis Awareness Month. Hi, Lynn. Jerry, thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, uh, just a few comments about Myositis Month and also our theme for this, for this year. Normally, um, May is a very prolific fundraising event for me, a lot of, for us, a lot of celebration, uh, a lot of uh, important educational seminars and, and games. Uh, of course, something happened in the process of um, planning this, and that's called COVID-19. So when this happened, the, it was obvious that we couldn't go forward with uh, the uh, ideas and strategy that we had set up. So we have switched I want to talk a little bit about what we're focusing on. Uh, this right now we're focusing on three areas, um, and in terms of how people with myositis can cope with uh, the pandemic, one is around education awareness with uh, uh, work sessions or education sessions that talk about the the sort of, sort of the connection between COVID and myositis. The other thing is that we're doing is our patient support groups, video patient support groups, are focused on helping people cope. In other words, we'll sit and talk about how, how we're feeling, our anxieties, the stress that we're feeling, and the fear that we have from uh, this pandemic. And finally, we focus, we're focusing this uh, year on financial aid and assistance, and we've made some adapta adaptation to our financial assistance program to better serve you because we know that there is need, need out there from a lot of people and we want to be there here to meet that need. So Jerry, why don't you show the next slides? So I think that this sort of incorporates all of our, uh, the ideas that we had for our new Myositis Awareness Month and it's abbreviated. We will be doing some things this uh, time in May and we'll also celebrate in September also. So we'll have a more fully formed um, awareness uh, sessions, fully formed awareness sessions in. So what we're doing is we're, we're incorporating all these themes around support education and financial aid. And we're including, uh, including the fact that we are now five years old as a nonprofit organization and we are the, and our commitment and our support and caring is at the heart of our community. So welcome to MSU's Myositis Awareness, Awareness Month. And with that, I'd like to tell you a few things about our speaker for the day. Dr. <clears throat> Agarwal, Rohit Agarwal, uh, I know many of you know who he is, uh, but I'll, let me give you a little bit of his credentials here. Uh, Dr. Agarwal is Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He's the Chair of the Medical Advisory Board of the Myositis Association and also the author of the book, Managing Myositis, a Practical Guide. Um, Dr. Agarwal is on a mission and that's to help educate both patients and doctors about myositis. And my, many of you may know him through his wonderful series called uh, Myositis 101. Before we start, I have asked Dr. Uh, Agarwal to just give us a few words, some of his insights into the past four months. I, it seems like this year has gone already, but I know it's only been, what, 
three months, three or four months since we, uh, since the pandemic hit. But I wanted to give him an opportunity to just talk about some of the long-term implications of COVID on how my side's patients uh, care and treatment might be managed in the future. So Dr. Agarwal, if you're there. Sure. Um, Thank thanks. You. Um, thanks, Lynn and Jerry, for a nice introduction and um, telling us all about uh, what MSU is about and doing. Um, and welcome, um, um, my SRS patients, on this webinar. Um, today, we'll be just taking questions on COVID-19, but I thought I would want to give a little bit of introduction about uh, COVID-19. Uh, so first of all, I, wa I want to make three points. And first of the point I want to make today is our myositis patients are having significant difficulty due to this COVID-19 crisis. And in fact, we actually did a small study on it in last month or so, a survey of the patients. We got about 600 responses. Um, and what is clear to me that our myositis patients are having significant problem because of various reasons. One of the biggest reasons is obviously they are at somewhat increased risk. Why are they at an increased risk? Because what we find that our myositis patients being older uh, in population mostly, um, they have more prevalence of heart disease or lung disease or diabetes or hypertension, all of which puts them at a higher risk for COVID-19 infection and its complications. Um, the second problem with uh, our myositis patient is many of our myositis patients have interstitial lung disease as a complication of myositis. And when they have interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis, that also may cause worse outcome for COVID-19 infection. The third um, is that many of our patients are on immune suppressive drugs. And as you know, immune suppressive drugs might uh, make you more prone to infections. So, um, patients with, COVID, with myositis may, get, uh, may easily get COVID-19 infection and may have a worse outcome. So these are the risks that our myositis patients are exposed to in the COVID-19 world. Now, what are the day-to-day -day difficulties they're having? Uh, we were surprised to understand that many of our myositis patients who are on IV infusion drugs, whether it's rituximab or IVIG or other drugs, they are having significant problems in getting their infusion. Because if they go to the infusion center, they are exposing them to a very high risk environment of the infusion center or the hospital. So many of them had to delay their IVIG or miss their IVIG infusion. In addition, many of our patients are having difficulty in getting their medication because forget the medicine, they have to go to the pharmacy and you know, getting out of the house is kind of risky nowadays for some of our patients. Um, so getting the medication is difficult and they're relying on their family members and other sources to get medicine delivered at their home. Uh, another thing that I found interesting that many of our myositis patients obviously are working and are considered essential worker. And some of them actually have to go to work go to the workplace to work, which obviously puts them at a higher risk with all the other uh, things we talked about, about their risk. And uh, last but not the least, I think, and in fact, my, might be the most important point, that physical therapy is not happening during this session, during this COVID-19 infection. So many of our patients are suffering because they're not able to get through their physical therapy sessions. Um, they had to delay their physical therapy, which is delaying uh, their exercise regimen and improvement. Uh, as you know, exercise is the key treatment for myositis, especially including inclusion body myositis. Um, so they're not able to get through their exercise that they really need to prevent their muscles from deteriorating. So these are all the problems they're having. On the top of it, these are all medical and logistic problems. But on the top of these problems, they're also having significant fear and anxiety fear of getting infected themselves, fear of having a family member infected, fear of taking care of an elderly or a kids uh, in family. Uh, so there's a lot of fear and anxiety amongst myositis patients because of this COVID-19 situation. Now, second point I want to share is some good news. Uh, and what this good news is um, that basically that we thought that our immune suppressed patients are going to be very high risk for COVID-19, getting COVID-19, and if they get COVID-19, 
they are also going to have a major problem in recovering because their immune system is suppressed. So, um, uh, but what the good news we're getting is that many of these studies are showing that immune suppressed patients are not at that much of a higher risk for getting infection, which is a very good news for myositis patients. They are at slightly higher risk, but it's not like they're 10 times higher risk. Um, for example, just to give you ballpark number, uh, if 1% of the population is at risk, immune suppressed patient may be at 2% risk. So still, it's not like 10 times higher. That's what we were thinking initially. And the, more importantly, if they do get infection, most of the time, even on a very immune suppressed patients, the infection itself is very mild. And most of them are recovering very well, despite of heavy immune suppression. So those two things are, I think, are very good news. So at least I can say they are not at a much higher risk. And they, if they get it, it's still okay because they got, most people are recovering despite having on the immune suppression. Um, so one advice I would give is do not stop your immune suppression because of the fear of COVID-19 because that can be detrimental to your disease and actually maybe counterproductive uh, in, real, in the real world. Um, and last, uh, the third point I wanted to make before I go for the questions is that how to prevent COVID-19. And I always talk about three things that we need to do. Number one, uh, we definitely need to do frequent hand washing, sanitization. Uh, basically, the idea is if you are at home, even if you're at home, you know, do frequent hand washing. But whenever you step out of the home or in the home, that should be a ritual before you get into your house, you need to first wash your hands before you touch anything in your house. Um, that should be a given. When you're outside, use a, carry a small uh, hand uh, sanitizer for you to be using almost every hour or so. Um, if you go somewhere, if you visit some offices or store, um, getting in and out of the store, use your hand sanitizer and so on. The second thing I say is if you're getting out of the house, wear masks all the time. Uh, in the house is not a big deal. You cannot, you don't need to wear the mask, but outside of your house, you should wear the mask, especially if you're going in closed spaces like stores or pharmacies or workplaces and so on. If you're out in the open, it's less of a risk, but still, it would be still advisable to keep the mask on. And, and then the third um, thing is social distancing. Still maintain your absolute social distancing. I think everybody understands now why you're staying away, why you're not shaking hands and so on. You, there are other ways of greeting people. Um, use those ways, and uh, and and those. If you do those three things itself, I think the overall risk of infection can come down significantly. Thank you, Dr. Igawal. Just a, a quick question, and we appreciate uh, all that information. So, while myositis patients on immune suppression may not be a huge um, percentage increase, according you know outside of the the other population, um, that doesn't mean <clears throat> that we should get cocky and yes, super yes. confident and stop all of the other things. No, no, no. In <laughs> fact, in fact, I told you that they, they are at risk because of interstitial lung disease, because of having diabetes, blood pressure, um, lung disease, and cardiovascular disease. It's just that I was addressing the immune suppression aspect. It does increase your risk, but initially when the things got worse, we thought um, that it's going to be a... a, a, a a uh, doomsday for our patients. It's not, at least it's not that bad. That's what I wanted to go. Great. I just wanted to make sure everybody realizes that, yes, still focus it on those last items that you talked about, the mask, social distancing, and hand washing. So thank you for that. First question for uh, Dr. Agarwal. What advice do you have for high-risk myositis patients navigating the period between the relaxation of the stay-at-home orders and social distancing measures and the rollout of an effective COVID-19 treatment and or vaccine? First of all, that's a great question. So first of all, I wanted to address vaccine. I personally don't think we will have vaccine before the end of this year and even maybe even further down from there. The normal estimates of a vaccine development is you know 12 to 18 months and um, that so it will be probably sometime next year the second thing is the treatment effectiveness we have getting now getting good reports on multiple lines of treatment um, we those treatment are not super effective as 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 of now 
but as in more as with time more and more treatment comes in picture will be better uh, and effective in managing the covid-19 uh, situation now what should we do in between the two things you know relaxation of the order up till we get a vaccine or a treatment um well i think those three things that i discuss are critical the three things we discussed is continue wearing mask all the time when you're outside continue wearing doing hand sanitization hand hygiene and the third um, thing is maintain your social distance if you do these three things um you know stay at home as much as possible if you have to go out you go out do your work come back um if you want to socialize there are other ways of socialization now like video chatting uh you know talking to your or um you know um talking to uh, you know i've seen actually in my community people are um having uh, their porch parties so their neighbor sitting on their porch and discussing things so they are at a very uh, large distance so um those kind of things you could do uh, but absolutely do not get um, complacent uh, uh, by thinking that the lockdown is over and we can do anything anymore take you back on that <clears throat> should we stay home until there is a vaccine um and yeah. if there is a live vaccine is it something that we would be able to take if we're on immune suppression therapy oh good question so let me address the live vaccine so typically what we recommend is live vaccine is not allowed for patients with immune suppression but the devil is in the detail what immune suppression are we talking about if we're talking about heavy immune suppression such as drug like rituximab then we would not recommend getting a live vaccine but if you're talking about a low dose of prednisone or a low dose of a methotrexate or imuran then getting vaccine at least live vaccine in other situations have been uh, shown to be beneficial for example herpes zoster live vaccine can be given to patients on methotrexate or a very low dose of prednisone now obviously we don't have the vaccine so i can't tell you exactly for this vaccine if it's a live vaccine what's going to happen but least previous experience tells us as a normal mild immune suppression um it might still be okay um and what was the i think the question before that i'm forgetting if you don't mind um try to show me the question again yeah do we need to stay home well you do need to stay home as much as possible so if you have to go out to a pharmacy or a store for some some need do that but keep the three precautions we talked about wear the mask all the time hand washing and social distancing go out get your stuff done come back um the other thing um to to want to uh, emphasize is when would it be safe in your community or your district or your city to go out typically what we say is when the infection rates uh, community infection rates in your community is about 40 to 60% then overall it would be safe to go out because then the risk of transmitting the infection from a person to person decreases considerably but obviously that hasn't happened yet and that's going to be long time to have to that for that to happen dr agarwal the next question is it possible for a myositis patient to contract the virus and be asymptomatic or just have a mild case absolutely actually that's what we are finding that most patients who are uh, with autoimmune disease um including myositis they are not getting severe infection they are rather getting mild infection so we are finding that most of the cases are actually mild in fact uh, we were surprised because patients with myositis and autoimmune disease are immunosuppressed so we were rather sur- pleasantly surprised that the most of the cases are a uh, mild but also many cases are asymptomatic we know that about 25 to 50% of the patients in general could be asymptomatic we don't have exact numbers on asymptomatic cases uh, amongst the myositis or immune suppressed or autoimmune disease population so that i don't know but we but my our guess is many of them would be rather asymptomatic but we do have data on being it a mild disease in most patients uh the next question how are providers balancing the need for tests and in person visits with the risks of exposure to covid-19 uh the second part uh, you've discussed quite a bit uh precautions that patients can take but maybe they might be a little bit different if they do go into a clinic setting yeah so what we are doing for example from next week we are starting our in person visit 
So what we are doing is we are doing in-person visits only for more urgent patient or patients who really need an injection or, a, uh, you know, or ha needs to be seen because they're having significant problems. The patients who are doing well, for those patients, we are still continuing the online or, or video chat uh, way of managing or telemedicine um, way of managing those patients. So the good news in doing that is only some patients could come to the clinic. When only few patients are coming to the clinic, that decreases the patient risk as well as the clinic risk of having the infection. And when they do come to the clinic, we are doing a screening of the patients. If they have a fever, they won't be allowed. Or if they have symptoms consistent with COVID-19, they would be tested and so on. And, and, they, and once they come in, we, what we are doing in our clinic is double masking, where the patient and the doctor are going to wear the mask throughout the session and minimize the contact that they have. And, and obviously, it's difficult to maintain social distancing in an exam room, but whatever it can be, we, we're trying to adopt that. Um, so my, my advice to the patients, at least for this month and the next month would be, you should go into your doctors if it's really, if you need to go in, uh, because you're having certain problem that needs to be addressed, or you need an injection or you need an examination before, without which the doctor cannot determine uh, and not treat you appropriately. But if you don't need to go in, means you've been doing, do, it's, it's a normal healthy checkup, or it's a normal myositis visit where you're feeling great. And all you need to do is refill your medicine and make sure your labs are checked and so on. Then you don't need to go in. And the other point about was the labs. Um, so what's happening in many labs are offering a phone appointment uh, where what they're doing is you can call them and set up a time where you come in. So when you come in, then that's generally only you who would come in the lab, get their labs done and get out of there um, and with not, not crowding the space with many patients at the same time. So they're going by appointment system. Uh, many laboratories have started doing that and you can make the use of that, calling them ahead and making an appointment for a lab work. Um, that would be the best way so that you can prevent and minimize your exposure. Thank you. Next question. What, uh, what is the best way for myositis patients to stay up to date on reliable information or recommendations without becoming overwhelmed? Seems oh. like we're getting bombarded all over the place. So. Yeah, I think there's a lot of information uh, floating around. Um, the few things that I could recommend, at least I, I have done about two to three videos on COVID-19. I think the last video addresses the problem of masks. I'm going to do another one coming week. So if you want to go for reliable information, my advice is to go for a reliable source. Because if it's coming from a reliable source, the information has to be reliable because people... Um, at my level or other reliable sources generally would vet the information before disseminating it. So that's one of the, so for example, if you're hearing a news, see a more reliable or standard news. If you're going online, go to reliable websites. For example, American College of Rheumatology have a whole section on COVID-19 and autoimmune diseases. Uh, we know the Myositis Association has similar uh, information or page on COVID-19 related information, but I would welcome you uh, to my YouTube videos as well, where I'm trying to disseminate the information as best as I can on COVID-19 situation. Thank you, and we do appreciate those videos, and we do have those <clears throat> available on our website as well, and we do have a COVID-19 resource center uh, also, so thank oh, you. perfect, so I, yeah, you. that's great. Uh, the next question about IVIG infusions. Uh, is, has it been shown that IVIG, or excuse me, IVIG could help protect uh, someone from COVID-19? So IVIG will not increase your risk of getting COVID-19, like, for example, immune suppression does, but not IVIG. And the second uh, part is, no, we have no evidence that it will be protective against COVID-19. Although we do know if you keep your disease under control by getting IVIG infusion, keeping your disease under control itself would be a protection from COVID-19 because if your disease is well controlled, then you're going to live the normal healthy life and will have be less likely to be exposed to COVID-19. And even if you get COVID-19 and your disease is controlled, your will, body will have a better chance of fighting COVID-19 because your overall autoimmune disease is controlled. 
So continue your IVIG as best as you can. If you want to hold it, discuss it with your doctor. Is it safe to hold one treatment? I would not hold it more than one treatment because generally we start to see flare up by the second or the third month of post IVIG. So it, I have advised to hold uh, IVIG on certain patients, but only one dose, so only like a one month dose and advise them to go back on the dosing from the next month to prevent the risk of flare up. We're bombarded with huge images of the COVID-19 virus in the media. It looks like a soccer ball type thing. But that begs another question, and that's how big is the virus? And can you talk about the virus a little bit? What the, you know, the characteristics that have made this so dangerous? Yeah, so the virus itself uh, is very, very uh, small. I mean, a virus is so small that our eyes cannot see them. Uh, even under regular microscope, we would have significant difficulty in viewing the, micro, uh, the virus. So even under like 100X, which is 100 times bigger uh, imaging under the microscope, you could see the virus, but it would be still very, very tiny. Um, we use somewhat what we call as electron microscopy and other things to see these virus structure overall. So it is very small. Now, why does this virus is so, um, uh, you know, problematic? The reason this problem, uh, this virus is so problematic, we have had other SARS virus, and this is a, uh, you know, SARS type virus. The reason is, it is because of its infectious rate. There's something what we call as R0. R0 is the risk of one person infecting how many other person. Typically, the R0 of one or less than one is not big a deal. For example, flu R0 would be less than one around one. This virus has an R0 of more than two, which means it can increase exponentially. So from one to two, two to four, two, four to eight, eight to 16, and so on. So it can cause exponential increase in infected number of patients. And that is why this virus is so deadly and different from flu virus. Um, and also, uh, the, way you, uh, the way this virus can easily infect people is because it actually um, uses uh, one of our body's own um, a protein to bind to in our lungs. So what happens is when, I, when we inhale the virus through our nostrils and our mouth, it actually binds to a specific protein in our body. So it finds a very easy host. It's almost like a lock and a key. So it seems like the, the lock is already there in our body and, the, and this virus has a key to it, which it binds. And as soon as it binds, then patients get infected. Whereas other viruses has to find a way through in your body. This virus has an easy way in your body because of that lock and a key phenomena I was talking about uh, where uh, specific proteins give them an easy entry to at least bind to our body structures. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, is someone with inclusion body myositis without any lung disease or say without any other of the risk factors just having IBM, does it put uh, those patients at a higher risk of complications due to COVID-19? So first of all, IBM patient without lung problem and not taking immune suppression are also very high risk. And the reason they are at high risk is because of their age itself. So having, uh, being elderly itself is a high risk for COVID-19. And when patients are older, they also are more likely to have comorbid conditions like diabetes or hypertension or cardiovascular conditions, irrespective of their IBM. Um, the third reason IBM patients are at high risk is many IBM patients have respiratory muscle weakness. So essentially, they may have difficulty in clearing the virus because their lungs are not completely effective because of the weakness in their respiratory muscle uh, system. Um, and also, because of the decrease in the mobility of IBM patients, that also may play a role in having more complications from the virus because uh, its body's ability to fight that infection is somewhat uh, limited in IBM patients. Uh, remember, any viral illness, you may remember having a virus illness last, and you can think all your muscles hurt when you, when you get a viral infection. That's the same is true for COVID-19. It causes myalgia, which is muscle pain, 
when patients with IBM already have weak muscles, this myalgia is going to cause more trouble for those patients. So yes, overall, various other reasons, irrespective of the lung problem and irrespective of immune suppressive drugs, IBM patients are at higher risk for complications due to COVID-19 patients. Thank you. And the uh, second part of, of this question that came in was just asking, you know, is it safe to allow a cleaning crew to come into the home to clean if the patient leaves while they're there? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And, and uh, if there is no contact, I think it's, uh, it's uh, okay for the cleaning crew to come. The one thing I would mention that you should make sure that they don't have any symptoms of COVID-19 and have not been in contact with a known positive COVID-19 patient for last 14 days. If those two conditions are met and if somebody wants to get the house cleaned, it's okay as long as you're not in the house um, and, 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 and obviously make sure that person cleans it well using all the uh, proper cleaning techniques, um, including uh, alcohol wipes uh, on, the, on the surfaces where you would be uh, using it mostly, for example, kitchen uh, shelf or dining table. Uh, perhaps um, uh, alcohol wipe would, could be used uh, to make sure those, those areas are completely disinfected. Great. But, if you, you, but, but if you could avoid, if you could avoid, then it's, it's best to be avoided. Great. Would you uh, go as far as even to maybe uh, ask the person to take their temperature before coming over? Or is that um, not an indicator? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you have to just believe and uh, see uh, if the person is, uh, you know, just ask them if they have a fever. I mean, I think that might be enough. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Next question here. Uh, I will be moving this summer and need to find a new care team. Are there strategies to successfully establishing the new patient-doctor relationship when so many appointments <clears throat> are through video rather than in person? So I will be, um, yeah, so I think, first of all, the person who are moving is going to have significant difficulty in finding a doctor uh, who could actually take the patients uh, on, uh, on in-person visit, because even now we are not really encouraging in-person visits as much. And in-person visits uh, also uh, is a risk for those patients. So my advice would be to take a video visit if possible. Now, if you're moving, you're going to have also have difficulty in um, having the video visit as well, because many doctors don't want to do video visits for new patients because it is difficult to assess a new patient on a video visit as compared to an established patient. So uh, I, I hope you don't have much difficulty, but it was best to establish uh, an appointment early. And if possible, uh, if you're not, if in-person appointment is not available to do a video appointment, um, uh, but act early rather than uh, too late because most doctors are really busy right now. Um, and uh, because of this COVID-19 situation um, and are struggling, uh, to, in, to have newer patient appointments come, come through. Thank you. Um, is it safe to get takeout from restaurants? Oh, yeah. So uh, the, I personally have done that uh, many times, and I think it's safe to, take, uh, to get a takeout from a restaurant. Few precautions I will tell you. Uh, when you go to the restaurant to pick up, please wear the mask. Okay, so that's once you get out of the car, wear the mask, take the stuff, come out, come in. Um, so when you come home after taking out, uh, make sure you keep uh, the the outer covering uh, uh, on your doorstep or outside your home. Don't bring that thing in. Uh, bring the the actual containers in, and then transfer the food to the plate and throw the containers uh, as best as best as you can and as carefully as you can that will uh, probably decrease the risk or the exposure because if you're only exposed to cooked food, um, then that will definitely decrease your exposure. Uh, is it safe to put um, produce in fridge without washing it? Um, that, it's a tough question. Um, uh, I mean, my, full, my recommendation would be to wash it 
uh, because that way you're making sure there is no um, you know virus attaching to it. Uh, but obviously, it does go bad faster. Um, it, uh, my, I mean, it's, uh, my still my advice would be to wash it before you refrigerate it. That's what we are doing at home, at least. Thank you. The next question. Um, <clears throat> With the new reports of suspected inflammatory responses to COVID in children, and some members of uh, MSU who developed acute symptoms of their myositis after inflammatory responses to infections, such as mono, do you think this is a risk? Um, so first of all, um, um, first of all, I will tell you of a case where a patient developed myositis after COVID-19 infection. So I think whosoever made this comment is correct that many times viruses um, stimulate our immune system and lead to the manifestation of myositis. In fact, many times what happens is patient may have an underlying myositis, but it wasn't causing much of a problem for somebody to notice. And here comes a viral infection that actually increase the immune response and uh, autoimmune response and lead to more problems with myositis. Um, so that is absolutely true. Fortunately, we haven't seen many reports of COVID-19 causing myositis. I'm just telling you one case report. Now, if there's one case report, probably there could be other cases as well. Kids, um, we are seeing some reports, but by and large is far and few. And even if it happens, it's still much better outcome in kids as compared to who is 60 years or more of age. So still very few infections in kids and still kids are much better outcomes as compared to elderly. Next question. Can Ig boost immunity and help prevent disease? Uh, my doctor wanted to combine Ig with Plaquenil. Have you found that there is um, an HCQ shortage and does this sound like a good combination? Yeah, so first of all, I mean, let me address the Ig. Immunoglobulin generally does boost the immunity overall, but it, it boosts an overall immunity. It's not specific to a particular bacteria or a virus or anything. So there is no evidence that getting IVIG will prevent or save you from COVID-19 or uh, infection, or if you get an infection, will have a better um, chances of uh, coming through it. What, it. what I would say is doing IVIG, if you're doing it for your myositis, doing that would help to keep myositis under control, which itself may help you to fight the infection better. So it's an indirect way of benefit. I don't think there is a direct benefit. At least we don't know if there's a direct benefit. The second question is on Plaquenil. Um, so earlier studies on Plaquenil, all of the studies were weak studies. So none of the studies has, even now, none of the studies have come out as strong studies. So all we have is a weak evidence. Initial few studies suggested weak positive evidence. Subsequent few studies have suggested weak negative evidence. At this point, we cannot say Plaquenil is good or bad. I think we need to wait for a better, well-designed study on Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine to make a judgment one way or another, or to recommend or not to recommend one way or the other. Is there a shortage? Yes, there is a shortage, but not to an extent where patients are not getting um, their hydroxychloroquine. The shortage is to an extent where patients are only getting about a month's supply at a time, which is okay. Um, the reason is the pharmacies and supply chain is is controlling how much hydroxychloroquine up one patient gets. So what they're doing is instead of three months supply, they're only allowing one month supply so that the patient can get through that one month and then they will give another month supply. So overall, I don't think um, there's a major shortage because most of my patients are getting it, um, but they're just getting less uh, frequency, uh, less doses each time. Okay. All right. And there's a, a second question here, too, that is not exactly not COVID related, but myositis related. And that's that I've seen many providers for my dermatomyositis, dermatologists, rheumatologists, GI, etc. I'm still not convinced that my diagnosis is completely correct. Do you have any? any suggestions for a doctor or facility that can pull all of this <laughs> information 
together and maybe give me a second look. <laughs> yeah, third. I mean, I, I would say if, if you are not satisfied with your diagnosis and you want to have a second look, the best is to go to one of the myositis expert centers. And there are a few myositis expert centers. For example, University of Pittsburgh, where I am, we have four myositis doctors. That's what they do. Day in, day out, they see myositis patients. So that would be one advice. You know, um, Hopkins has a myositis center as well. Uh, we know um, uh, KUMC, uh, Kentucky University Medical Center, has a myositis center. Stanford um, in LA, uh, Cedars and University of California has uh, some myositis specialists. Um, so you need to go to an expert center if you're not satisfied. That would be my best advice. Now, these expert centers are that's their job to look at the three years of re records and come to a consensus and give you a, a one visit answer after reviewing everything. Question After um, medical remission, can you gain strength and unassisted mobility with water therapy? Yes. Um, and uh, so there are two issues that I want to talk about when we talk about medical remission. One, there are two things that goes parallel in any myositis patients. One is a disease activity and the second is disease damage. So over the period of time, disease damage gets accumulated. With disease damage means muscle atrophy, muscle damage, and so on. Um, typically, we cannot reverse the damage, muscle damage or disease damage. But disease activity can be reversed and can be brought into medical remission. So it depends on when you got into medical remission, what was your damage level? Whatever was your damage level is the, is the worst you're going to get because hopefully no new disease is happening. So you're not going to get worse. In terms of improvement, physical therapy and exercise and mobility is the best way to improve the damage over years. See, disease activity changes over weeks to months, whereas damage is very difficult to recover. And some patients are able to recover from damage as well, but it takes years of excess, months and years of exercise and physical therapy to recover some damage. Exercise is recommended for myositis patients, but can you exercise too much? No, no, you cannot exercise too much because the basic rule of exercise is if your muscle are feeling a little sore, that's a good outcome. But you don't want to go to the exercise extent that you're hurting and in pain after exercise. That's not recommended. So if you don't, if the, you're not going to be doing too much of exercises if you know where to stop. Pain on exercise is a lim should be a limit of exercise. Muscle soreness, mild muscle soreness is a good outcome of exercise. But don't take it to the limit where you're going to rupture your tendon or muscle or going to cause severe pain to yourself. That's never a good outcome. So don't do that. Just a little bit of, do enough exercise that the muscle feel the soreness and the stretch, like a good soreness and a stretch. And then in that case, you will not be able, you never do too much of exercise. The other thing that I advise is, if you want to do exercise, do on a regular intervals as well. So if somebody is able to do two times a day is better than one time a day. Three times a day is better than two times a day. So do more, more frequent and do it daily. And the last question that we have here, uh, before we all look at uh, the Q&As that may have come in, is what is, Excuse me, one more after this. What is your opinion on bone marrow transplant for myositis? Yeah, so very interesting question. So uh, let me talk about the bone marrow transplant in another disease, uh, which is similar to myositis in many respects. In many respects, it's different as well, but is scleroderma. Bone marrow transplant is now a successful treatment option for scleroderma patients. For myositis, we are lagging behind the research in bone marrow transplant for myositis patients. So at this point, I cannot give you an answer, yes or no, if bone marrow transplant should be done. I can tell you currently the evidence is lacking, if, uh, but the studies need to be done. And if the studies are positive, then that would become a viable treatment. But as of now, today, 
bone marrow transplant is not a viable treatment for myositis patient, not because it doesn't work, it's just because simply we don't know uh, about it, whether it would work or not. So it has to be tested in scientific studies before we can recommend uh, widely to our patient. Now, who would I recommend bone marrow transplant if I have? Um, I would recommend a patient with severe interstitial lung disease with significant worsening we, who cannot get a lung transplant um, where the, the outcome of the patient is rather poor. In that patient, perhaps going through a bone marrow transplant for myositis um, on a compassionate basis may make sense. But otherwise, we cannot widely recommend it because we don't have enough evidence. Jerry's looking through the Q&As online. And this, this question is, what is your understanding of why the Veterans Administration does not recognize IBM as a disability? Well, I mean, first of all, I'm surprised to know that. I don't work in a VA, so I uh, I'm, I'm apologize that I don't know this information. I just am failing to understand why would that be the case. IBM patients, at least advanced IBM patients, has visual di disability. That means you don't need a doctor to, te to say if uh, an advanced IBM patient should have a, is disabled or not. You can just see the patient for five to 10 minutes. You can interact with the patient. Um, so it, it, it's pretty for me to think that, uh, for me to know that the IBM is not considered a disability. In fact, I'm one of the doctors who only give the disability if, if it's truly needed. And IBM is on my number one list of saying okay to the disability because of the because it is a disabling disease. All right, thank you, uh, Jerry. Thank you for that answer. And uh, Dr. Agarwal, I, I don't think it's just specific to the Veterans Administration, but I think it's um, in the overall Social Security Disability Program, uh, where they you know they list like uh, there are certain diseases that they do list out. Um, and IBM is not one of them. So there's additional steps that have to be taken <clears throat> for them to, uh, to get approval. Sure. Well, thank you for, for your honesty on that. I mean, sometimes yeah. you just don't know the answer. Yeah, you just don't know. Right, <laughs> and that's, that's okay. Um, so there uh, have been some things that have come in, uh, some questions, and um, I'll start with the first one here. Uh, thanks, John, for your question. The study showing that those who are immunosuppressed are not at a significantly higher risk. How large was that study? Do yeah, so this study that I'm quoting is from Italy. You know, the Italy was an epicenter of this problem. And it was 165 lupus patients who were studied who were on immune suppression. And they did have increased risk. So don't, I don't want to make uh, people say that they were, they're not a, they were at increased risk. But it wasn't 10 times higher risk. That's what I'm trying to convey that we were at least at least in my mind i was thinking our myositis patients who are immune suppressed are going to be five to ten times higher risk of this infection that wasn't the case the next one i've i've been walking in the park almost every day fortunately there are not many out many people out i've been wearing a mask but always take care to move off the path if someone comes along should i start wearing the mask all the time outside when i'm doing this so if you are outside in open spaces, mask is not mandatory. Uh, if you are sure that you can maintain six feet of social distancing. So to find an answer on this question, I think you need to look at my complete talk on Myositis 101 on YouTube, um, because I am addressing this very issue in my talk. Uh, but it's not absolutely mandatory to wear masks when you're in open spaces if you can maintain social distance. Would it be favorable? Yes, it would be favorable because you don't control the life situations all the time. So it'd be, it would be advisable. Yes, it would be advisable, but it's not absolutely mandatory. And speaking on, on masks, I know that I've seen a lot of uh, people that, <clears throat> that don't want to wear them and say that you know, because it's their, they're claustrophobic, uh, and induces anxiety. Uh, are there any tips or recommendations on? Okay. Yeah, um, so it's actually uh, people who say that um, actually, uh, if they can, they can wear simple cloth mask, even that would be something um, than a regular mask. So all they need to do is wear like a kind of a bandana 
on their face, even that is protective as compared to having nothing on the face. And generally those simple, there's a thin cloth, it's like a double layer of a thin cloth, that doesn't cause um, that kind of anxiety or uh, claustrophobia to most patients. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question, Frederick, um, how does IVIG differ from other, um, quote, immune suppressants? Is it an issue with COVID-19 or vaccines in time? Yeah, so IVIG does not suppress the immune system. Um, so most immune suppressive drugs, the way they work is they decrease the fast dividing immune system um, cells. When they do that, um, they decrease the supply chain of autoimmune uh, cells to cause autoimmune disease. So essentially that decreases the disease manifestation and symptom. The way IVIG works is more in terms of controlling or regulating the bad immune cells or bad immune players. So it sort of takes the bad immune cells or players out of the system rather than suppressing all the immune cells, including the bad one. Okay. So that's the fundamental difference. Immune suppressants suppress all the immune cells, including the bad ones, whereas IVIG selectively takes out the bad ones out of our system. So that's a little bit of a difficult to explain exact science for me, but by and large, that's the difference. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, there's a question about stopping um, <clears throat> their immune suppression. Now, should I stop cell sept if I get COVID? If you get COVID, absolutely, you need to hold your cell set um, for the time being to prevent, um, in, uh, to, to let your body fight the COVID-19 infection. However, it's not completely clear whether that would be of significant help or not because we just don't have a data. But we know the cell set uh, in particular actually causes in, puts you in an increased risk of viral infections, such as herpes zoster infection. So even for that very reason, holding cells while you have a COVID-19 infection would be the best. Um, but your doctors might put you on steroid or some other immune suppressive drug to COVID-19. Uh, that is because most patients, they, when they have severe COVID-19, they have severe COVID-19 not due to the infection per se, but more because of the immune response of our body to COVID-19. So it's our immune system that overactive, gets overactive to fight COVID-19 that itself causes uh, this uh, uh, inflammation in our lung and other organs uh, that lead to poor outcome. Um, the next question, and this is, a, this is one that's a little personal for me as well, Shireen. Um, my husband is a dental assistant, just went back to work full time. Uh, her question is, uh, is it okay to go to the dentist for a regular checkup? I would say if you're on immune suppression, avoid it. I would not, I would ad advise to avoid it as much as you can. Caitlin has a question. Can you speak a little more about the best types of masks uh, to use? Yeah, yeah. Again, um, I think, I think um, uh, my advice would be to see my full YouTube video on Myositis 101. If you type on YouTube Myositis 101 and Agarwal, um, you will find my video on mask. I think that will give you the complete answer. Otherwise, it will take me a long time to answer that. Uh, but in general, I would say multi-layer of fabric is better. If you put a filter in those layers, is even better. Um, and, uh, and the main uh, outcome of the mask is not what type of mask, but how often are you wearing it? And are you wearing it properly or, and taking it off properly? That is the key. So for that, I would encourage you to watch the, the video I'm talking about. Great. And uh, we'll also be sure to reshare that, um, that video on our social media sites so everybody can easily find it. Sure. Um, we are running out of time. So let me just see. Uh, do you have time for another question? Yeah. Yeah. I have a couple of more minutes. Okay. Um, let's see. Is telemedicine legal across state lines? The AMA and Medicare says it is, uh, but some other uh, doctors are saying that they can't do it because it's not legal. Yeah, so that's a great question and actually a very personal question because many of my patients, many patients are contacting me to do telemedicine across the state line. Um, so if there is an established patient, so if I have a patient who's my patient or seen me once, 
that is completely okay to do across the state line. Where the guidance is not clear by AMA or Medicare is what about taking a new patient across the state line? And that is not clear. So what the solution has been proposed is you can do an e-consult across the state line. For example, a doctor friend of mine contacted me for his patient and he's in Delaware and he wanted me to see this patient and what, we, what we're planning to do is he, the patient is going to see my friend doctor in Delaware and at that visit, they're going to do a telemedicine with me with the doctor present in Delaware and that is completely allowed. Um, so it's a, like a little bit of a twisted way of getting around but new patient across the state line is probably okay. The, the legal answer we got from our university lawyer is probably okay but I cannot assure you on the legality of it. That's the answer I got. But the e-consult way um, or consulting a doctor is a assured way. Are there any, this is a controversial one and it may take uh, more time than you have, but are there any benefits to stem cell therapy for IBM? Yeah, so uh, I mean the stem cell, bone marrow, transplant, they all come under the same category. And the problem is the research in this area is very little. Um, uh, I shared an ex example of scleroderma where it was clearly helpful. And I'm hopeful one day stem cell therapy would be beneficial or proven beneficial for IBM patient. At this point, we just don't have enough evidence to say that it is of any help for IBM patients. And also remember, all these therapies, stem cell therapy, bone marrow transplant therapy, also has significant mortality, um, significant risk of infections and uh, death due to the complication of stem cell therapy itself. And that has to be considered. Um, why would I recommend something which is not proven when I know there is a one to 2% of death from the procedure itself? Great. I think that's a, that's a great answer. Thank you. What signifies remission? I've been, in, uh, I've been treated for anti-synthetase for five years and my doctor has never mentioned it. Yeah. So what signifies remission is that uh, there are two types of remission. One is remission off medicine and on medicine. So typically remission means that your organ systems that were affected are normal or near normal. In other words, uh, there is no active disease for which your doctor would want to put you on additional medications. So, and this is, all, this is on treatment and off treatment. So in other words, you could, doctor could have taken you off all treatment. That means that's the best form of remission, means, means remission off treatment. But sometimes doctors are able to have to maintain long-term medication and keep the patient in remission long-term and that's called remission on therapy. And both are a good outcome. And is, it just means that an organ or disease manifestation are normal or near normal. I have polymyositis and I'm stabilized on prednisone, IVIG, and rituximab. If I did end up with COVID-19, what is your opinion on the use of the silzumab? I'm sorry, I can't even yeah. 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 And one of the COVID-19 treatment has been proposed, but not proven yet. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah, so what's your option to use? I mean, I think if, uh, again, it depends on a lot of different situations, but if that is a treatment that could be given, um, um, then, then I think it will be safe to take it. We have done a study on tocilizumab on about 35 polymyositis, dermatomyositis patients, and we found it absolutely safe to use this drug in myositis patients, whether it's a beneficial for myositis or COVID-19, that's a little unclear. Thank you. Finally, one last one. I've been diagnosed recently and have now lost all upper body strength and cannot raise my hands above chest level, chest height. Mm -hmm. Is it still safe to attempt some gentle exercises? How will I know when I'm in remission? I think you've answered that a little bit. I am on both steroids, and uh, have started immunosuppressants. Nine weeks yeah. on steroids and second week on immunosuppressants. So first question, can you start exercise? Absolutely, you should have started it by now. 
exercise itself is a treatment for myositis. So more you exercise, better are you going to improve your muscle strength. So number one. Number two, how do I know that I'm in remission? Well, if you get to almost near baseline of your, then you know that you're almost in remission. So in other words, uh, your daily functional activity, if you're able to get to about 90% of your previous baseline daily functional activity, only then you will be considered in remission. And I'm getting from what you're saying that you're very off of remission. You, you have severe active disease right now. It takes years to get into remission, not months. I mean, you're talking about at least one, two or three or more years to get into remission. So I think you need a long-term treatment You've been only on steroid for nine months, uh, nine weeks, and started immune suppressive drugs only for two weeks. It will take you weeks to months to improve. And my guess is it takes six to 12 months to get to, you know, even to get to say that I'm doing much better. The immunosuppression drugs themselves can take that long to even make a difference, correct? Yeah, yeah. It takes two to three months for immune suppressive drugs to work. Okay. And that's the end of our, our uh, Q&A. So uh, we thank everybody, and we especially uh, thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Uh, we appreciate your time, and <clears throat> you know it's always great having one of the experts join us. Um, so we appreciate that. Uh, we will have a recording of this available within the next couple of days. So if you uh, want to share it with your friends, have them watch this and uh, learn more about myositis and COVID-19, uh, we highly encourage that, of course. And, and uh, uh, thank you. And sorry for the disturbance uh, with my daughter a little bit here and there. No worries. Like you said, it's real life. It happens. And we're all learning how to adapt, right? <laughs> thank you. So we, we do appreciate it. And uh, also for everybody attending, please, uh, we, next Tuesday, May 19th, we have Paul Kidwell presenting five stories at the heart of caregiving. And then on Tuesday, May 26th at 7 p.m., uh, these are all Eastern time. Uh, the new It's My Turn campaign, Becoming a Plasma Donor Hero with CSI Pharmacy and the Immune Globulin National Society. Uh, so please uh, check out our website to tune in for those events. And here's how you can do it. Uh, our website, understandingmyositis.org. And then our patient and caregiver experience website, our myositis life is myositislife.org. And you can always contact us via email. Appreciate everyone's uh, attendance and, and obviously appreciate having Dr. Agarwal on. Yes, thank you. And thank you for your time today. <clears throat> you always do such a wonderful job and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a great day and thanks for joining. Take care. <laughs>